Hello, this is RV Vagabond Jerry, and in this video, I'm gonna give you a complete tour of Miss Laura's house, and this is the historic bordello, and I understand it is the only bordello that is in the National Register of Historic Places. It is located about three blocks from the Fort Smith National Historic Site, right alongside the railroad. Where she built her extensive as a hotel, all that was around it was actually called the Riverfront Country. And this was uh, of the others that were down, uh, down the road, and that was where it was a prostitution was allowed then. then. Was on the road. Hers is the most expensive, yet it was also the most successful. In fact, it was called the Queen Ralph of the Southwest at the time. And this was her office during that period of time. By the way, all the wood we can see is original. The other remaining stained glass original is about transferred here. That's what we can trace the years for damage. I'll explain that in a moment. Okay. Which is age. But this was a Dutch door during her operation, and it would be an office there. This was always shut, the top was open. And rather than having money exchange between the collars, the gentleman collars of the women who worked here, she had a token system. And what was euphemistically called a favor was $3, an overnight stay, and that it was a hotel with a $5 fee. Thank you guys for and the others down the road were only charging a dollar. Thank you. Only charging a dollar. Yet it was the most, most popular and most successful. Her office and that Joe and her apartment. In the apartment, uh, is, she was the only one who lived downstairs. The girls not only lived and worked upstairs, they worked upstairs, they lived upstairs. It was uh, their place of residence, too. And it operated, as I mentioned, uh, with her being the owner for about eight years, I guess, almost nine. And she sold it to one of her working girls, named Bertha Gail Dean. And Bertha Gail had it, uh, though the prostitution was not law enforcement in 1924. The uh, birth girl had it up through the, the 1940s, and it became, after it had been outlawed, it became a boarding house and started going downhill. Well, she left. She just had enough of it and went to Missouri, she being birth. She couldn't give it away. Couldn't give it to her brother or to her ex-husband. And it just sat here for years, and the city said, if somebody doesn't buy this and fix it up, we're just going to tear it down, regardless. Local businessmen in town do buy it. Take care of these. So you spent about six hundred thousand, maybe seven hundred thousand, investing in it, bringing it back to what was period, and what it looked like during her time. And at, during that, he worked with the city to get this property listed on the National Register of Historic Places, and it was the first brothel on the register, and I think still maybe the only ex brothel on the National Register. However, uh, the fellow that bought it, Don Reynolds, he put the money in here to make it a court retreat. Corporation said, Yeah, wait a minute, we're not interested in this as a court retreat. So he leased two guys from Oklahoma to turn it into a restaurant in the 1980s. In the 1980s, we called Miss Laura's Social Club, and all the downstairs parlors you'll see in a moment were open eating areas that you just pull in, and if there was space, you'd have dinner. And the upstairs rooms were the girls' rooms during the operation of the brothel were private dining rooms where you called in fans and three hundred individual parties. Really, it was really a pleasant place. This is the bar over the area that was the service bar pretty much during that time. They didn't make a, uh, they made a lot of money, but they weren't a very good businessmen. They went out of business. And the city in 1993 became the visitor center in 1993. 1996, history I'm afraid I hope doesn't bore you, but 96, we had a tornado come through. And if you look here, you can see what Mr. Lawrence did by before the tornado. That's what it looked like then. After the tornado here and the bottom over here is what it looked like immediately afterward. The tornado ripped the entire roof off, the massive roof off, dumped five inches of rain in the building. And then the city went ahead and spent another almost 700000 to restore it to what you see today. There was some discussion at the time that some folks in town didn't want to have a, a ex-brothel as the visitor center, but it was so unique. It's the only one in the country that it has as a business center. That the, and the Cougar has prevailed, and they said, you know, we're going to keep it. And they did invest the money and brought it back. 
The original powers used were the dining areas in the 1980s as the restaurant, but during Dolores Day, they used for powers. There was gaming. It was a gentleman's club. It wasn't just a brothel solo. So a gentleman came here for that purpose, yes, but also to play cards, have a drink, uh, whatever it might be. Story down the wallpaper, the wallpaper, and though this is not original, what they found in one of the restoration processes by pulling the paper back, they found the original layer of paper that would have been from Laura's time. And there's enough on it to not only see the print, the design, and the color, but it was just not in good shape. So the, the uh, restoration found that the company that made the paper for Laura had gone out of business, but a company in the UK indicated, you sent us a template, well, we can recreate and recraft whatever you want in the amount. So they did, and so what you're looking at here in color, the design, and the print, and even the texture is exactly what it was during Laura's time. The pocket doors still work in their original, and there's an little anecdote about the doors. Laura, I failed to mention, when she sold it to Bertha Gale, she sold it after having up just around 3,000 investment in housing property, she sold it for $44,000 to Bertha Gale, which would be the equivalent of today's dollars, around $700,000. Pretty shrewd woman, and I think an indication that would be that during that period of time, maybe in California, I don't know, but a lot of the property taxes that people paid were not just based on the assessed valuation, it was also the number of rooms you had. For example, I live in a home that's said to be a historic district here in town that uh, was built in the late 20s or early 30s, and the bedrooms have limited closet space because that, once again, is considered a room under that uh, process. Well, Laura would hear about the assessor coming down. She would open these pocket doors up and make this one long room that you see. And then when the assessor would leave, she would shut the doors to go back to the individual products. So it would cut down her taxes somewhere. All the furniture is period pieces, antique. We have three or four pieces that were actually Laura's. I'll show you that as we're walking around. On the wall here, this is the token. These are facsimiles. We used to have an original, and it was in the hand of the mannequin you may have seen in the office when you first came in. And several years ago, somebody came in. We don't know who. It's not pointing fingers, but they did a PBS special in the house. And before they came, the cameraman and the crew, the mannequin was holding the, the coin, the original token. When they left, it was gone. The photos here were found in the other brothels down the road. Not in this house at all, but the bottom right is Bertha Gale at an older age, Bertha Gale being the one daughter from Laura. And uh, we had to do some connecting the dots here, but if you look at the photographs, actually all the photographs, you'll see poses, and these are not all from 1890, some of these are earlier, before 1920. They're kind of provocative poses, but if you look at the very top left of this first frame, the top right on the middle frame, and over here behind you, the bottom left of that frame on the other wall here, you'll see the building behind it. That building behind it is this house. And I think then and even now you'd have to ask what respectable, if you will call it, what respectable girl do I have a photograph as a backdrop to a brothel? So those connections, these are probably working girls at the time. And they were found, once again, they were found in one of the other brothels downtown before it was damaged and no longer here. No, the other six are exist any longer. This piece here was also Laura's. The, the veneer top I can't attest to, but the piece itself is. And unfortunately, I have no idea about the chain of ownership. No idea at all. But somebody during that period of time, and it's well over 100 years old, tried to distress it to make it look an antique. If they just left it alone, it would have been an antique obviously on its own. All the fretwork above you, as well as the dental work on the ground molding, that's all original. And even though that they had machinery, I'm sure, to do that kind of uh, lathe and such for the design, it was still, in what we would see today, somewhat primitive. It's really hard when you look at it and consider it. You didn't go to the. We can go in here if you want to. This, uh, during Laura's time, this would have been the fourth parlor also with the women, and she would have their, their meals. It was the kitchen during that time. During the restaurant period of time, oh, they took this wall, which was also the uh, last pocket door, <coughs> shut that down. This entire area became the kitchen. 
And since there was dining upstairs during that time too, there was a dumbwaiter over in the corner for food service to the upstairs. This was found here in the, in the, in the house. And this bar is over here now is the bar that was actually the service bar during the uh, time of the 1980s. It was the restaurant. And rather than just getting rid of the city out with the key, it became the visitor center and brought it back here. It's all original. It's well over 100 years old, but it wasn't ours. Uh, made over in uh, Oklahoma. And everything on it is original. So I just drive and leave when I get ready. Sit back near the door, exit door. Mm -hmm. During the time of, uh, well, from the 1870s on, Judge Parker, the hanging judge, I don't know if you ever heard anything or not, uh, the Ruth to Cod Bar, I think, made it kind of famous too. That's a print of uh, Judge Parker later in life. He came here as a friend of the old man. And he was the federal law for 73,000 square miles of Indian country, which is over Oklahoma. The civilized tribes, as they refer to, all in that area over there. And uh, he was a hanging judge. It wasn't a monarchy that was given to him by Hollywood. He hung 79 men, although he did get to many more than that, but 79 of those convictions were capital offense. And as the hanging judge, and whether it's just trying to rationalize, but I'm ask him about it, he said, as a person I'm personally against, Capital punishment, philosophical, and personally against it. He said, but I didn't convict this man, or these, these gentlemen. They were convicted by a jury of their peers, and I'm the federal judge, and the law demands the capital punishment, and the offense is going to be death. And he had both deputy marshals and U.S. marshals. This is Bass Reeves. Bass was the first U.S. deputy marshal, uh, African American, Western Mississippi. And he was hired, whereas most marshals, not most, all marshals are appointed. Deputy marshals are engaged uh, by the federal prosecutors, and they'd heard about him. In 1876 is when he came on board, and when he had been, he was born a slave, actually, over in Van Buren, which is just north of us, across the river, in Arkansas. But they moved to Texas. He, when he was a young man, the owners moved to Texas. He went into Oklahoma, got out of Texas, and lived among the Indians. He learned the languages. They learned to respect him, he them, and he is. Unique for the period of time, again, this is late 1800s, and he was well over six feet, pretty stout guy, and known to be a straight up shooter, not just a straight shooter in the literal sense, but also a straight kind of guy. And Judge Parker heard about him and said to his prosecutor attorney, go out and hire me some additional deputies. And they went after Bass, and Bass said, yeah. Uh, he was a stand up guy, I mentioned he was once his own son, who lived here in Fort Smith, was accused of murdering his wife. His son's wife. And none of the other marshals would go out after Bass's son, so Bass went out and got his own son, Jack Cooley, who stood trial, Parker, convicted and sent to Leavenworth. Later released him, he was later, so he wasn't the first degree. <coughs> and I know you're familiar with the Lone Ranger, as we all are be growing up there at the time. But Bass Reeves is being considered man of one now, as the thought behind the development of the Lone Ranger. Known for a couple of reasons. One, when he would go to Oklahoma, he would have an Indian scout with him. More of a sidekick than a scout. And sometimes, because it was overnight, he'd have a, a cook train behind him, a wagon. Also, when he was put up overnight in Oklahoma, going after his man. Unlike the, the Lone Ranger, many, many, many years later, Bass actually lead, would leave a silver dollar on the nightstand as a thank you for letting him stay the night, as opposed to the Lone yeah, Ranger leaving the silver bullet. Well, yes, he started well, putting some things together, and it's now not becoming more and more. In fact, there's been two movies made of his life, and it's the third one in production, I said to the HBO, that he is the essence of what the Lone Ranger's development, you know, the guy that developed it. Pretty cool story. We're going to go upstairs for a minute, but I want to find a couple things out, <coughs> particularly coming down. It looks like an optical yeah, yeah, illusion. The banister ends here, but there's two additional steps coming in. And that's not a design flaw. It was actually built in for a purpose. Uh, and the purposes are, are really two. One, the depth of the step is to accommodate boots, which was the most of the general war. And two, this is the end of the Victorian era during when Lawrence operated. And as odd as it seems that when you think about it, these the girls both worked and lived upstairs. And any woman going up there was going up there for, in all likelihood, a, what was legal, but still a sort of a, uh, a risque operation going on. Yet it was 
and seeming for a woman to raise or to see any of her ankles as they were walking upstairs. So the steps are done this way to bring out the slower and, and a more gentle slope going upstairs. So the ankle would be shown by the woman walking upstairs. It's a paradox, but it's it's pretty bizarre. Now please remember these next these last two steps. <coughs> The window well is architecturally original. The window itself is not. <coughs> Excuse me. The window was designed based on that print right there, which was found in this house. It's an original design, an original print from who we thought was a, 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 he, and definitely his poster painter period, a Lutrecht, his Toulouse, Lutrecht, and some others. But we thought it was by a fellow named Alphonse Muxa from Czechoslovakia. This would be right around the turn of the century, 19th and 20th century. And it later turned out it wasn't. And you can tell because the Mucha, if you ever look him up, M-U-C-H-A is his name, he did not do the detail in the nails, and yet this print does. However, this was done by a local volunteer like myself from this house, so it was a volunteer here. And he crafted this based on that print. Also original, this is office. This is handcrafted here. And, uh, <coughs> and that would have been in her apartment downstairs. The rooms up here were the girls' rooms during the operations of property. And when it became a restaurant, these are the private dining rooms. And you'll see in the transits above the names in the, uh, in the glass. <coughs> this is looking down, it's called the Duval. And they all had names. And that was to help the restaurant tours. <coughs> Pardon me. Used like most commercial establishments, there needs to be a hook, something to make it different, stand out. And what they did is they looked at the census data from the 1900s, 1900, 1910, for Fort Smith. And during those uh, times, there are different questions asked from the census. And two of them are, what is your place of residence by address? And then also, what is your place of employment by address? So when they found, for instance, here in Fort Smith, let's call her Duval, Duval, whomever, was living probably working at 105 Front, and that's also her place of residence. Okay, you live and work here, okay, that makes sense. So they use those names, and when you call to get your uh, reservation, my wife and I, we'd all get to the <coughs> monitor room, I think you'll see in a moment, for, for dinners. The uh, dresses were prepared by and designed by a local woman here in town. And uh, there are the dresses and the hats that Jane Seymour wore, Dr. Quinn Medicine wore. Her dresses. And this is just uh, stuff here has been donated. The globes are original, uh, before electricity or gas lamps. And if you look at those globes, going back to what I mentioned in the beginning, that being the uh, uh, Queen Roth of the Southwest, uh, this was known, they looked to be a bit of opaque. But if you think about a glass lamp, Behind it, there are wall lenses, and flickering. It would give that ambiance, that aura of you know, I think posh. That's the right word. It would give an aura for sure. Mm -hmm. And the room here on the left is a mock that would it's possible that one of the uh, most of the time. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, the uh, the average American. Then it was considerably smaller, and you'll see the bed is kind of at the uh, hybrid type size, as well as we've seen some of the clothing, you know, the seats and such. So it was a, they were designed for the upland user. That day bed you have filmed in there, that red day bed is, you have to think who could fit in that today? Yet it was a functional day bed during that period of time. I point out about the birth of Gail down the street, right down the street downstairs. This is Bertha when she was a younger woman, uh, probably more around the time that when she bought the house from, uh, from uh, Laura. And I failed to mention this theory. Bertha, rather, Bertha Gale had married a local gentleman here in town, Fort Smith, and he had been in the Navy. And our National Cemetery over here, of course, being uh, the eligibility of the FBI vet, and she, her spouse, and when he died, he was buried over here in our National Cemetery. Well, after Bertha Gale came back, and left, came back, and she passed, she's buried over there. And we're certain that she's the only former madam buried in our cemetery, National Cemetery. It's all, all likely that she's the only 
I'd say one of the few, if not the only, um, ex Madame Birdie in National Cemetery. The chips were found in the house. And once again, indicating this was both the Gentleman's Club and, and the brothel. And interestingly enough, too, the women that worked here, there were numerous women that worked here that made more money than the uh, doctors and the attorneys on our avenue for the name of the It was that, that big of a deal. And the bathtub was another indication, just looking at the size of that. There wasn't potable water on the second floor until after the 20s. Uh, but what was known was that the Bertha Gale party, Alara would have champagne parties for her girls if they had a good week or a good month or the time frame. And she was also known to take care of her frequenters here with champagne. And that would include her law enforcement and the judiciary. I'm not suggesting anything there, but she took care of those folks and they uh, likewise took care of her. And uh, that, my friend, is it. We had a port, small, that we had a port, uh, but mainly we had wars because various streets ended at the river. Garrison Avenue did at one time with just a ferry. A Street, the street, B Street rather, which is what you probably came in on over here, ended at the river and others did down there too. And there would be wars there and they would be for loading produce for local hotels. We had several hotels. And uh, then the outcry that would go out in terms of export were uh, a lot of hardwoods. We had several virgin forest, hardwood virgin forest around here. And uh, we are currently, we have a port now currently, but that riverboat, uh, because the navigation system for the Arkansas was not done until the 1960s, early 1970s, and navigation was very seasonal. And when there was high enough water, there would be boats like that coming into Fort Smith at these wars for delivery and import and export. We currently have a nine-foot channel. <coughs> that they're trying to uh, find the congressional authorization and appropriations to make a 12-foot channel off away from Tulsa. Katusa, actually right outside Tulsa, passed here and then down out the course of the Mississippi. All right, thank you very much. You betcha, sir. Good day. You too.